Hi everyone, this is Ashley Gronwald with Hunter Row Real Estate and I have two of my friends, Ashley and Rachel here joining me. And the reason I have them here with us today is because we're gonna be talking about the Enneagram. As you found, this is something I really enjoy and have ha found a lot of help from, not only in my marriage, but in um, my professional setting. And so I wanted to ask these two ladies to share kind of their experience because they are a different number than I am. Ashley is a seven, Rachel is an eight. Um, and I think they have a lot to offer so we're going to jump in because we have lots of fun questions. If you have a question and you're listening to this live, send it in and we'll try and answer it as well. And this will be from our perspective. We would be first to say we're not experts. Um, we just enjoy the Enneagram and it's been fun for us um, to relate to our friends, um, to our spouses. And so we hope that this tool is something you can use as well. So I'm going to jump right in um, and have you guys just quickly introduce yourself. Tell us who you are. Um, how many kids you have, what you do when you're not on here with me, and then we'll jump into some questions. So go ahead, Ashley. All right. My name is Ashley Unziker. I live in Wake Forest. Um, I have three children, ages 10, 9, and 6, and I've been married for 14 years. I actually just met my husband today 14 years ago. Um, I'm sorry. So I've been married 13 years. That would be weird. Um, so what do I do when I'm not on here? I are talking to you. I have, like I said, three kids are in a university model school. So they go two full days a week, then they're home three days. So it's kind of like, it's not homeschool. It's like a hybrid, kind of the best of both worlds with that. So that keeps me pretty busy for sure. Awesome. And then what about for you, Rachel? I'm Rachel. I have four children, ages similar to Ashley's actually 10, eight. It might take me a second. <laughs> Six and two. Um, and my husband jokes that we have a fifth child that was between my last two, which is uh, a small business. I'm a small business owner in the area as well. And I've been married 13 years. Tell us what that small business is. Oh, it's a CrossFit gym. It's actually right near Hunter Row. We're on uh, Strickland and uh, Six Forks. And it's awesome. I love it. That's great. United is um, CrossFit United, right? Is the gym that you're talking about. My husband. Yeah. Fitness. That, that's right. Yeah, started going there and that's what got him the most consistent in fitness I've ever seen. Now he's mm -hmm. off the bandwagon again, but when he gets back on there, he's <laughs> a good, you know, few years that he stays committed. So it's pretty awesome and I'm all for it there. So awesome. Well, let's jump in. I'll just share that I'm at Enneagram three. Ashley Unziker is a seven. So that's going to be mm -hmm. tricky when we're talking the two Ashleys. I'm a three, she's a seven, then Rachel is an eight. Um, and so let's jump into these questions and let's see what we can learn about each other in the Enneagram. So the first question is, what do you do to have fun? What does self-care look like for you? Or how do you relax? So me, Ashley, three on the Enneagram. And for those who don't no, is the achiever or the performer is generally what the three is associated with. And so for me, all fun, self-care, relax. These are not going to sound fun to a seven to ask them, <laughs> I wouldn't think. Um, but for me, they are exercise, organizing, and reading. And, and that's how it comes up for me. Not for all threes, but that's how self-care, relaxation show up for me. And I also really love thrifting and consignment sales. Mm -hmm. Those are like my jam. So what about for you, Ashley Unsiger? Yes, that is different than what I enjoy. I like, like dancing parties and singing and making fun videos and going to as many parties as I can, hanging out with friends. Um, lately though, I have had some more chill things. Like I've gotten into like painting, gardening, a little bit more chilled out. Recently been mountain biking. That's new. So Rachel and I have been doing that. <laughs> so I like new things, traveling, that kind of stuff. Well, and I was even going to say, if anybody, if I think all those videos are still there that you've made, but you've made some yeah. really fun, like pregnant mama videos. Yes. Um, ones with all your kids are in them. My husband even is in one of them. Just <laughs> and then you rapping some theology. <laughs> so if you like to see fun videos, you gotta go check out Ash Anziker on probably YouTube, but we could find it's it. It's on YouTube. Yeah. Awesome. What about for you, Rachel? Self-care, fun. What does that look like for you as an eight? You know, when I first read that question, I'm like, oh, self-care. What is that? <laughs> I don't have time for that. <laughs> As you both know, I didn't have time to fully prepare for this. Self-care is not necessarily a word I use in my vocabulary, but I actually love all of the things that you guys mentioned. Exercise is definitely one that keeps me sane and I enjoy it um, a lot. And I do love adventure. I kind of, I relate to new things and I love traveling and exploring new restaurants. You know, I do love that side of things for sure. But 
I would say I despise cleaning like with a passion and, but I thrive with order. And so yeah. I have to have that structure and I force myself and my children and others <laughs> to maintain order because I function a lot more healthfully when things are where they should be. And so I just a follow up question for you, Rachel, just to say my husband is an eight, so I want to learn so much from you, but is order natural for you or does, is that something that you love, but isn't always priority? It probably varies by eight, I would guess. Um, for me personally, my husband would say that he thinks that I love order and, and thrive on it and it comes naturally to me, but it doesn't actually. It's more that it must be there because efficiency is not possible without it. And I'm like an efficiency fiend. And so for me, I don't love spreadsheets. I don't love, you know, putting my silverware lined up perfectly in the right drawer. But when it's not, I like, I panic. And I'm like, well, who would do that? Like what kind of person would put this in the wrong place? It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Which I sometimes I mistype as a woman actually, just because I, I just love order because it makes sense and I love systems operating efficiently. And so I do it more as a discipline than a passion, if that makes sense. That does. And saying that you mistype as a one makes sense too, because one that those do sound like more one traits. But I would say like with my husband as an eight, his closet once every three years maybe is like immaculate <laughs> that was on my side. And then the rest of the time for a day or two. And then for the rest of the, you know, year and days, it's not. So I just was curious about that order thing for you. So there great. may be some male, female differences there as well. Totally. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Well, and one thing that I think is fair to share that, you know, Jed doesn't get excited when I talk about Enneagram. So that's why I'm talking to you guys and not him because he doesn't want to hear about it. But he is really surprised. And I want to hear if this is the case for you guys, but that I kind of categorize, I want to know people's Enneagram and Myers-Briggs type and strengths so that I can put them in these folders. And he's like, I put if I was, he said, I don't put people in a folder, but if I had to put someone in a folder like you do, they would be their own folder and the title would be their name, not their Enneagram type. Huh. Like yeah. I put people in eight, you know, mm -hmm. folder or the seven folder or the six. And he's like, that's just not how it works for me. And that really bothers him because he does like individualization. And so the fact that I'm clumping all these mass amount of people into one folder titled eight, he's like, I want no part of that. Do you feel that way at all, Rachel? Or is that not? Relate. Absolutely. I relate to what Jed's saying. Um, I think you touched on something really important that the Enneagram is a very useful tool to help us kind of organize people's motives instead of assuming the worst intentions. You know, when they behave a certain way, we'll think, oh, you're just a dominating jerk. You know? But in reality, we realize they feel out of control and they like order. So let me love them rather than accuse them. And so I think the Enneagram is a great tool to have in your marriage belt, but when it is used as a weapon or like a jail cell, like I, I would assume sevens probably often feel um, wrongly. And Ashley, you should speak to this as a seven, but I feel like a lot of times they're just categorized as a seven. Well, you don't like commitment and you can't finish any project that yeah. you start. And they despise that about themselves and want to not be that. And so right. they feel trapped. And I often, Similarly to Jed, I'm like, I don't want to dominate people. That's not me. Like, don't right. dare put me in the box. I'm much bigger than the box. <laughs> <laughs> I think it can be a useful tool, but it can also be a dangerous weapon if we're not careful. Yeah, I agree. Can you speak to that, Ashley? Just as a seven who does like fun, do you? How have you come about the enneagram and not feeling boxed in, or does it make you feel a little bit boxed in? So yeah, thinking through this, one of the things that people typically think is that we're flighty or flaky or we don't stick to a commitment. I actually am not like that typically. Like I, if I tell you I'm going to do something, I like to do it. It's the right thing to do. And I would want, I don't want people to flake out on me. It feels terrible. So no, I, I don't like that boxing in either. I do think it's a useful tool and most things seem to be pretty accurate with it. But yeah, I don't want to be put in a group of people that are like, Oh, they're just the partiers. They don't do it. You know, don't care about people. <laughs> so right. and keeping commitments. And I guess that for me as a three, I don't know if this is my threeness or if this is just meanness. I don't know, but you know, I love diving into the Enneagram and learning more about myself. Cause it's like these light bulbs go off in my mind of like, that's why I do that. Or, and so for me, it's like identity forming and it just has all these awareness and Jed's just like, 
I am who I am and that's just the way it is. You know, he doesn't yeah, care yeah. to know why. He's just like, this right. is who I am and it's great. And I'm like, I don't know why I do that. And I want to know and I want to, you know, and yeah. he kind of has given me a lot of aha moments, not as a crutch. That is not the point of the Enneagram is to give us a crutch of like, well, right, that's how right. I am. That's what threes do. But it's like, oh, this desire to perform and achieve is like an any that that speaks to a three. In the enneagram that's very right. unique in me so it can go amok and i can't lean on that as like well that's just what i do but it does give some really big awareness for me as a three mm -hmm. so i'll jump into the next question i like this i think it's a, a fun question so what is a pet peeve of yours relationally that fits with your enneagram type so if you know looking at the different types and maybe as you explain this answer, maybe give just a little synopsis of what your number is like I did. That would be helpful for people who might not be as aware or familiar with it. So again, three, Ashley speaking, yeah. a pet peeve for me relationally is I don't understand when people are not super motivated and wanting to achieve and be the best and win at everything. That doesn't make sense to me because that's the filter that I look at the world. So when people are just like, I just play to have fun. I'm like, what is that? <laughs> play to have fun. I don't play unless I can win. So, you know, so that would be a pet peeve of mine of just like, you know, people in school that weren't motivated to be the best in class and get A's on every, I didn't understand it. So that was, mm -hmm. I, would, I would say a pet peeve of me that fits with my any. Enneagram type of wanting to perform, perform and achieve. So what about for you, Ashley is a seven, give a little synopsis of what a seven is. And then if you can answer the pet. Yeah. I mean, sevens, we want to have a good time. <laughs> we like to enjoy things and we yeah. want to like how, you know, life is, it can be really fun. And so I guess my pet peeve is when people don't see life as fun or that they, I don't like pain. I don't like discomfort. So bringing pain or discomfort into a situation is a real ruiner. And so I think that would be my pet peeve because I'm like, no, 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 you know, let's make this, this is good. Let's have fun. So I don't know, I guess my pet peeve would be just maybe um, a bad attitude, which I can have. I can have a bad attitude a lot, um, but just bringing a bad attitude or a negative vibe or whatever you want to call it into a situation. I don't like confrontation. It really, that really bugs me kind of like a nine, honestly. I just, I don't dig it. It's not fun for me. So I guess that would be my yeah. pet peeve. So it's like <laughs> you don't want the Debbie Downer that comes in. You guys are all having a good time and somebody comes in and just crashes the party. And it's right, like, oh, right. Oh. So let, no, pump up the music and let's right. have a good time. Dance the cares away. <laughs> That's such a good example. What about for you, Rachel? Pet peeve and give a little synopsis of this eight that you identify with. Yeah. So as an eight, I want truth to prevail in all circumstances and I want justice to be had. So when there's any sort of deceit or hiddenness or dishonesty, I'm pretty repulsed by it. And I would say that's a pet peeve of mine. Like I will forgive much and I can work through conflict as an eight. I also just love the other side of conflict, I won't say I love conflict necessarily, but I love what comes from uprooting pain, you know, in a relationship when you have hurt or wounds and you just hide it. And I'm like, I have friends that are nines and sevens and a lot of sevens and nines actually. In my life. And I love them so much, but I'm like, what, what is it to just sit here and like think bad thoughts about the other person, tell them those thoughts right. so that you can work through it. You'll understand one of my uh, life mottos is to understand before being understood. And I want to I want to do that in a way that's tender and kind and not so abrasive as uh, my habits and my family would, would do. <laughs> I uh, think that my entire family on one side in particular is all eights. I mean, just all eights. They just love conflict and directness. And Ashley's panicking even as I'm talking. Oh, no, no. <laughs> just deep breathing, just deep breathing. <laughs> Yeah, family reunions are pretty hilarious. There's no cussing or anything like that where it doesn't get real aggressive, but a lot of wounds are had, a lot of little jabs with words. And so for me, it's just a pet peeve is not saying things and like um, reclusing or what would you call that? Just kind of like backing away in a relationship. I'm like, don't be a coward. Just tell me, what is it? How have I wronged you? And I'll fix it and I'll never do it again. We'll work through it. <laughs> I, hate, I hate when distance or hiddenness, you know, causes pain or dislike relationship separation. And I would assume this is similar, but yeah. like for Jed, I think things that annoy him about me is like people pleasing or the fear of man. 
You know, he's like, I just don't get that. Like, tell them what you think. They're not no better than you. You're equal, you know. So that idea of like trying to be something you're not, he totally doesn't get and is frustrated by that. And then also just being afraid to say how I feel because that can help the, the relationship move forward. Otherwise, you know, holding it back doesn't help. So I think that might be similar. And I think a lot of times this may go into a question that you have later a little bit, but a lot of people think that eights are fearless, you know, that they don't have, and that's true to an extent. We don't, uh, I don't as an eight ever consider people's opinions. I mean, not, I shouldn't say not ever, but almost never. I'm very often just, this is the right thing, or this is the justice. Like I have to push through the hard to get to the good, or I see the goal in mind, similar to a three in some ways, where you know we're always like achieving and, and striving for goals to be accomplished <laughs> and efficiency for me personally. And I don't have that fear of, well, what will people think? That's never a thought. In fact, when people have that thought, I think, this is apart from Jesus. I have a walk with Jesus that impacts every aspect of my life. So apart from Jesus, I would assume the worst of that person and being married to a three. So we're actually the opposite of you and Jed, Ashley. Um, he's the three. I'm like, why do you care? Who are you doing this for? Like what a coward would consider people's opinions. Like you go be awesome. And who cares if they're, you know, whatever. But with Jesus coupled into my heart, he, he doesn't allow me to have that um, type of condemnation right off the bat. And he just helps me And the Enneagram has really helped me, like you said, have language. And I think it's more language. It's like you can identify that without this condemning, how dare you be that way? I'm just like, oh, this is your natural tendency. And there's some, as a Christian, there are some things we each personally need to repent of that are not obedience to the to God. But um, there's also just a lot of things that we need to accept about one another. And it's okay that you're motivated by something very different than me. I shouldn't try to turn my little three husband who's amazing and like such an achiever into a dominating eight. That's not who God designed him to be. <laughs> and you touched on such an important point is the motivation. And that's why they say trying to type other people is dangerous because we could be doing the same action or behavior, but the motivation is vastly different. And so you can't know someone's motivation unless they know it and they express it to you, probably in words. So sell or trying to type other people can be risky because you don't know the underlying motivation. And like you said, a three and an eight can look very similar because we might be doing something similar, but then our, our motivation driving it, I'm doing it as a three for people's approval and to think, highly of me as an eight, you put it in your own words. Why did you do the thing that I'm trying to make myself look good about? You just do it to because, because I can. Because you can and want to, right? Absolutely <laughs> different. Which I'm I like, I will. <laughs> and you will, and you'll get it done. Yes, so true. So let's go to the next question, which I think kind of go, flows into this. And I'll let you answer it, Ashley, first as a seven. Where do you feel misunderstood as a seven? Again, with the flaky and flighty things, I do like to keep commitments. And so I do feel maybe a little misunderstood with that, that I don't take things seriously ever. Cause I do, I do take things seriously. And another thing is a lot of people think with sevens that we're always optimistic. I think also um, coming with like on the heels of receiving Christ and, and kind of following him, I do, I am grounded in knowing actually the realities of our hearts and our minds are not always the best, right? I mean, <laughs> mostly the worst. So <laughs> I do realize that, you know, bad things happen. People do wrong things. People have wrong motives. So I wouldn't say I'm just always optimistic that everything's going to pan out and be wonderful. But, but there is on the other side of this life where everything's going to be great. So everything will be awesome on the other side of this as a believer. So anyway, I guess I would just say that there's more levels to the optimism part yeah. of a seven um, that I think could be misunderstood or like we don't take seriously, but I do. That's perfect. Yeah. And I was in small group with mm -hmm. Ashley and felt very, I get to see the side of you that was very serious and genuine. Mm -hmm. And yes, she loved to have a fun, good time when we would be in Zumba class together dancing. Yeah. But <laughs> at the same time, you would come to small group and dig deep and then you lead worship. Right. So that's a very deep, you know, heartfelt experience. So I, I, that makes sense to me that you could feel misunderstood there. What about for you, Rachel, misunderstood as an eight? I think 
there's this element of control. And I need to clear the record for all of mankind to stop accusing us eight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, trying to dominate that is not true i don't think i'm still processing this one i have heard that the core fear of an eight is to be controlled um like they don't ever want to be controlled and so i think for me i have had a lot of trouble when someone in authority over me is doing an insufficient job according to my standards if they're incompetent or uneducated or lazy or uh, even unintelligent, to be honest, is, is difficult for me. It's hard for me to respect someone that I don't naturally respect and to like muster that up is difficult. So I, I really struggle under those. But I don't, when I respect authority, have any desire to usurp it or uh, like take over. So I actually thrive really well with authority when it's respectable. <laughs> And so usually because of Jesus, again, because of Jesus, I can respect authority even when it's <laughs> what my perception of incompetent would be. But in general, that has been a struggle for a long time for me. And I haven't been able to pinpoint why. Now learning a little bit about the Enneagram has helped me see that. And I can kind of confess it and verbalize it and then like work towards having reconciliation with those relationships. But I don't have the need where I feel misunderstood. It's just, I don't have this need to dominate. When I walk into a room, I'm not like, I'm in charge. Everyone, <laughs> not at all. I don't feel that way. And I never do. I mean, there are moments when I recognize the fact that I'm as just an extrovert in general, or I should say Gregorius person, I realize that I do dominate a room and you can feel my presence. They say that a lot about eights is you can feel their presence when they walk into a room. I recognize that and I do want to keep that in mind so I'm not dominating uh, other people, but I don't necessarily have that desire in me to dominate. It's just that when there's a competence, I will step in because everyone wants me to step in in my mind. <laughs> Everyone's saying, where's the leader? Yes. Not a leader. Bring in a leader and I will, I will lead you. I will lead you. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, wow. I feel like I'm speaking to a female version of my husband. This is so <laughs> wonderful. So wonderful. Oh gosh. I will say I have a precious friend of mine who is just the sweetest. She's married to a four who is a very healthy four. So I love him. And they have this family axiom that's like, I want to be uh, there you are people rather than here I am people. Huh. So when they walk into a room, I mean, they teach this to their little young kids that are teeny tiny toddlers. They're like, were you a there you are person or a here I am person today when you walk oh, into good. the classroom? And I think every Enneagram number should hear that, you know? I mean, a one may come in a room and be clearly like, these are the way things are, let me set the standards. A three maybe comes in and says, look what I have done. A seven can even be like, party, party. But like, if we're listening and we see the five, you know, who's struggling there or the nine that feels anxious about the conflict that's happening in the room or whatever, when we're we're listening and becoming aware of where people are at, it's been, it's been really, I love that family axiom and I want to steal it and put it on my wall. <laughs> so good. Yeah. Like just being aware of others and where they're at versus being so focused in on ourselves. That's so good. So I would say as a three, where do I feel mi misunderstood? Um, and I think it's, I tend towards task over people. And so I think that can be misunderstood as I don't care about people. Mm -hmm. I do. The task just is like, it trumps a little bit. And I hate that about myself. And like you said, Jesus comes in and reminds me of Mary and Martha. And I struggle with that a big, a lot, mm -hmm. a lot, a lot. But mm -hmm. I think feeling misunderstood that I, all I want to do is win. And all I want to do is step on people to get there. And is that a temptation? Yes. Mm -hmm. But I also, I am aware of the people around me. And so that, that I think that's the, the pool for me. Um, as a three, just, you know, wanting to achieve and perform, but also realizing there are people around that can get in the way of that and not to step on them or use them for my, you know, um, advancement. So one question I have just that might help clear up to some of this, because there's so many, I mean, there's the, the subtypes and then you have your wings. So there, we, 
we're just touching the surface, but I think I've just decided, I've always said I'm a three wing three because I didn't identify with either of the wings that I was like, I, I don't have a wing. I'm just three, three, three through and through. But the more I've studied the four, I think that's the part that I didn't understand about myself. And so I think I, I have to claim that is that I would probably be a wing Four. So Ashley, seven, what's your wing that you claim? I'm a six, six wing. So okay. the loyalist, um, the worry wart. <laughs> so I can worry about things quite a bit and foresee danger very easily. Yeah. So, but I'm loyal to death with friends. Like I, I want to stick by them and I want, I value friendship very highly and, and family, of course. So that's where I tend to go. And that makes sense too. If, if like how you said feeling misunderstood that you would be flaky. It's like if you're if you right. have a wing six, there's no way you'd be flaky. You'd be right. Ready. So that makes right. total sense. What about for you, Rachel? Your eight wing? Um, I just changed my thoughts on what I am. I used to think I was a seven because <laughs> I was really fun. And surely I don't like that nines cower in the face of conflict. And so that would never be me. Uh, however, I've decided that I'm for sure a nine. My whole life I kind of functioned as the uh peacekeeper in my home you know i'd have parents conflict or brothers conflict or all of my aunts conflict <laughs> and so i would often just say you know here's this perspective can we understand that they have this perspective even though so that was kind of my role growing up as a kid and so i think that that's more my natural my natural instinct i am fun though so i'm like a seven <laughs> I was going to say, Rachel is very multidimensional. She <laughs> is the most fun person to hang out with. That's why I've always been like, are you sure you're not a seven? Because right. she yeah. is like. Ask my husband. Ask my husband. He will tell you I could be a fun sucker, like, real bad. <laughs> I'm like, no, the things that have to get done. Why would we go waste time? Well, and I listen to Ian Cron's typology podcast. That's where I've learned mm -hmm. most of my Enneagram from. And the thing he says is, like a bird has two wings, they need both to fly. And so mm -hmm. you, you could, one shows up more and it's more obvious, but most likely you reflect both wings. So yeah. I thought that was helpful of that, that you need both to fly as a bird. Yeah, so that's good. through you to the Enneagram as well. So this we've kind of talked through already. So I want to see if you have anything to add, but are there things about your Enneagram type that don't seem to fit you? We've talked about feeling misunderstood. I was thinking about this question and I went and read, you know, the description of a three again. And I was just like, I just want to look for a word or a sentence. And again, I said, I'm three through and through. So I could not find one until they said threes are often the class president and the homecoming queen. And I was like, I was neither, but I wanted to be both. So <laughs> I wanted a bad and I tied for class president and then lost the tiebreaker. It was heart. It was a heartbreaking day for me. <laughs> and then a homecoming queen. It's like, you have to, that I think the part that didn't make sense to me about that is that you've got to really be people oriented. And I was academic oriented. I was like, how can I be the best and be in first place? And so I don't think people saw me as relatable or the, it, I, I see the homecoming queen as who's most people's friends. I mean, yes, they look up to a homecoming queen as someone they admire, but a little more relational. And I just was not, I was very yeah. focused on the tasks of school. But what about for you, Ashley, as a seven? Are there things about your Enneagram type that don't seem to fit you? You said the, the flaky part. Yeah, yeah. That makes um, sense. I think I can be pretty driven when I'm when I'm in the mood to be. <laughs> um, like when it comes to school, recently I just got my master's and I did better than ever. Like I just worked really, really, really hard. So I do have a competitive side to me too, where I, I think I want, if I'm gonna do something, I really wanna be really good at it. So I don't know if that really fits in with the sevens, um, but to me that's fun, the, the competitive drive, like even with workout classes or biking or whatever, it's like, okay, what are they doing? I wanna be better, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So maybe that's the eight wing, I don't know, I don't know. Yeah, exactly, so, that's awesome. What about for yeah. you, Rachel? Anything about your type that doesn't seem to fit you? Yeah, the the fear of vulnerability, I think, is something a lot of people believe about AIDS, that they don't want people to know their weaknesses. But I think, I don't know if this is just Jesus changing me or if this is who I want anyway. Okay, but I really want to strive to be better. And so I want people to know my weaknesses so they can call me out and I can change. So a lot of times... 
uh, aides are known to not, I don't cry very often, that's true, but um, they're just known not to talk about weaknesses. But I, if I can, like trusted people in my life, I have a lot of uh, very amazing people in my life. Ashley Unziger is one of them. But it's just, I want you to say, because I desire truth above all else, I want you to say truthfully, what do you see? What weaknesses of mine do you have? I want you to call me out. And if you don't, I will actually feel upset. <laughs> I feel like you're lying to me and just fluffing yeah. me up. When people try to encourage me or like, what is the word? I can't even think like flatter, I guess, or puff up. I'm like repulsed by it. Like I hate empty flattery more than anything in the whole world. So if people say you're the best and I'm not the best. I'm like, that's, that's not true. Why would you say that? <laughs> <laughs> but other people like love it and actually feel good about themselves. And I'm like, no, that's an accurate. <laughs> Speak truth. Always truth for every eight I know. It's truth. If they are a truth seeker, that's a pretty big signal they're an eight. That's so helpful. Yeah. And, and she's a good, she's good for me as a friend. I was going to just say, she's really good for me as a friend because, like I said, I hate confrontation. I don't really want anything to do with it. Sure, I'll take it. If you tell me something that I'm doing wrong, tell me, I do want to change. Like, I don't want to just stay being an idiot or whatever I'm doing wrong. Um, but she's helped me to like, okay, it's actually a valuable asset to a good friend to tell the truth. It doesn't mean you're like fighting or the friendship's over. It's it's actually good because we're spurring each other on. We're, you know, iron sharpening iron, that kind of thing. That's awesome. Yeah, I think the vulnerability piece is interesting because that's been my understanding with eight is that that's, they're not going to go there. Vulnerability mm -hmm. is a very scary place showing weakness. Um, but one thing I will say, I don't know if you've seen this, but I was listening to the podcast and they were like, there's a song for each Enneagram type. Go Google it. But I listened to it. I put it on the car for Jed to listen to. I was like, this song is about your type. Do you relate to any of it? And he was, I mean, he's like, does it basically say I'm awesome and the best and can do anything? Then it's caught on. But then I'm right about everything because that's true. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> So I don't know if that would be, I didn't like that they put it to like slow, sad music. It would be too much probably of a Debbie Downer for you, Ashley, but yeah. it was like deep and like really wanted to provoke emotion. I don't like stuff like that. I So I read the lyrics to see if it was mm -hmm. helpful, but anyway, it's out there for every type. Check it out if you think that'd be interesting. But Ashley now has, Ashley Unziger now has a task in her mind. I'm going yeah. to make an Enneagram songs for every number. I know. I've already, I've already done it. I've already done it. <laughs> Okay, I want to hear those. That's I'll send the link. Yeah, okay, I'll send the link. I'll put it in the comments. Please do. That's awesome. <laughs>